Welcome, everyone. I'm Sandra Bargeman. A few years ago, I wrote and performed a solo show called The Edge of Every Day, which was an exploration of the rough edges and contradictions we all face and grapple with. The show hit a nerve, and the relevance of the topic would only grow over time more than I could have foreseen. So, here we are. Real talk with real people, sharing stories and perspectives that spark provocative invitations to leap out of what's safe. On the edge of every day. Thanks for listening. Hello, everyone. We are live in the hive. Thank you for joining me on this, the 31st episode of The Edge of Every Day. NYC. For those of you who are tuning in for the first time, and for those of you who don't know me yet, I encourage you to check out my bio on talkradio.nyc, or of course, you can visit my website, sandrabargeman.com. And please tune in to any of my previous episodes with my inspiring guests. As all of my loyal listeners know, this show is about celebrating triumphs, pushing boundaries, and exploring rough edges. Through conversations and shared stories with friends and colleagues, it's my hope that we can begin to understand our edges. And what I mean by edges is those places where we are fearful, those places where we are resistant to change, those places where paradoxes and contradictions live in our beliefs and understandings, both about ourselves and the world around us, those places we don't want to look. We live in turbulent times, and we are coming to understand that life simply isn't black or white. It must be an embrace of both. And the more we recognize our own edges and get real about them, the more we can help others to do the same. And that, I fully believe, can help to change the world. So. Thanks again for tuning in. And without further ado, it is time to introduce our guest this evening. Betsy Gaines Quammen, PhD, is a writer, speaker, environmental historian, and conservationist. She is the author of American Zion, Cliven Bundy, God, and Western Public Lands. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, New York Daily News, and the History New Network. She has a doctorate in environmental history from Montana State University and a master's of science in environmental studies. Her dissertation focused on Mormon history and the roots of armed public land conflicts occurring in the United States. She is fascinated at how religious views shape relationships to landscape. Wildlife and land protection are her passion. She worked for years on conservation projects in Mongolia, Bhutan, East Africa, and throughout the Western United States. First with the East African Wildlife Society in Kenya, and later with various conservation groups in Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming on grizzly bear conservation, ecosystem protection, and grazing issues. She served on numerous boards from the National Sierra Club to Tory House Press to Wild Earth Guardians to the Dean's Council of the College of Letters and Science at Montana State University. She was the founder and executive director of the Tributary Fund, which brought together religious leadership, faith communities, and conservation activities in the U.S., Mongolia, and Bhutan. Betsy lives in Bozeman, Montana, with her husband, writer David Quammen, three huge dogs, an overweight cat, and a pretty big python named Boots. Her next book, True West, Sorting Realities on the Far Side of America, is out in the fall of 2023. Welcome and hello, Betsy. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. This is great. I've been looking forward to this for 
it, time flies, but we've been talking about this for a few months. So yeah, I'm just for a while, while, while. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I am thrilled to have you here. I've already gotten all kinds of texts about how excited people are to hear from you. And oh, she's your next guest sounds so cool. <laughs> Yes, she is. I've done a lot of research on her and yes, she is. Um, but I like to, I like to share with my listeners how my guests come to me, you know, connections and conversations, as you well know, it is, it is all about that. So I know you through our mutual friend, Leslie Michaels, who was just on my show last week. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plugging her glorious book. Yes. On the shoulders of mighty women in which I have a pair, uh, a chapter. I was going to say you're in it. I'm in it. Yeah. Gloriously. Yeah. <laughs> and she, and you know, we were talking, she goes, Oh, you have to know Betsy because she's, she's like you, she's environmental and she's in all of these lanes. And I, once I talked to you, then we had a zoom conversation. Once I talked to you, I was overwhelmed with a, the kindred spiritness of you and I. And, and I loved that, you know, all my life I've been told to pick a lane, mm -hmm. pick a lane, you know, and just stick there. But I've rebelled against that. And I have chosen to weave my, all of the passions and the things that I love to do and ways of expressing and ways of working in the world into one package. And I feel that's you. As well, you have combined your love of history and environmentalism and conservation and interfaith and religion and spirituality and storytelling all into this beautiful tapestry. Can you well, speak? Oh, sorry. go ahead. No, no, no go ahead. <laughs> I I was answering a question before it was even asked, but I just wanted to say, you know, what I think of and what you have such a good grasp on is you can't navigate an integrated world without understanding its integration. Indeed. Indeed. And that structure, I mean, our, our world has changed and we are realizing the interconnectedness and that, that old paradigm of this is what I do and everything else is just periphery is over. You know, the young people call it multi-hyphenate and we are multi-hyphenates. So, um, so how did, how did you stack up and how did you weave without going too, too far back into your childhood? How did you weave your, this tapestry? How, 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 what was the evolution of that? Well, I, I really do have a specific um, moment when I think I realized how uh, fragile the world was and how mm. important it was for me to be a part of keeping it whole and healthy. And, and gosh, since I had this moment, things have huh, accelerated and, and we're still, we have a lot of work to do. But when mm -hmm. I was um, growing up, I volunteered at the Cincinnati Zoo and uh, did it from the age of eight, from eight to 18, and was able to do any number of amazingly cool things. Um, but one of the things that would happen is when it would rain, I grew up in Cincinnati and it would rain really hard. It would just come down like cats and dogs. And I would be out on the zoo grounds and would race to the shrine for the last passenger pigeon, Martha, that died at the Cincinnati Zoo. And she was the last member of her species. And I remember thinking when I was in this essentially mausoleum for her, she's at the Smithsonian now, what wow. extinction means and, and how fi um, final that is. And I think it impressed me so much because I would be in there alone as an eight, nine, 10, 11 year old girl and, and would sit with Martha. She was someone I grew up with. And in that experience, uh, I really vowed to take care of 
the earth species. That was something that, that I was going to do. And I realized as I got into conservation, I, I mean, my, my, I got right into conservation. I, I, it, as, the, as soon as I graduated from college, I was the environmental reporter for the Telluride, um, Telluride Times Tribune. That's in Colorado and, yeah. you know, wonderful, wonderful experience. And then I moved to Kenya and worked for a wildlife magazine there. And then I came back and got my master's and worked on, um, conservation issues in the Northern Rockies, grizzly bears, fish, rivers, large landscapes. But I realized that I wasn't going to make a difference until I started getting out into communities and building relationships with people because it, it I was really siloed. I was talking to people who already agreed with what I had to say. So that's when I became really interested in working with religious leaders and, and, you know, now I'm working with rural communities. So um, that's, that's how it started. And, and as you and I have talked about, in order to focus, if you're going to focus on one thing, and in, in my case, that's conservation, you need to understand a number of different of things. Languages. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. My husband, you know, when I became an interfaith minister, he and, 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 and I came to the environmental field later, and partially with his influence on me, which was great, but it was also in, lived in me. I was very connected to the earth as a kid, but I never imagined it as, you know, something that I would be actively pursuing. But, but he always connected, you know, the climate change and the climate crisis needs the faith of leaders and needs conversation, getting them on board. Yeah. And that's when things are gonna move forward. And, you know, I haven't, I haven't done a ton of that with all the climate change work that I've done. I haven't had those courageous conversations with faith leaders at all. And you have. And this is an amazing, wonderful seg into, if you will, um, what brought you to, I mean, Mongolia. The, the tributary fund, the creation of that, you are the founder and were the founder and executive director of it, and which engages communities in conservation solutions through connecting religious, scientific, and local leaders. And I watched Buddha and the Big Fish. Oh, and it was- I it, was blown away. Uh, thank you. It was narrated by Peter Matheson, who um, is a Nor New York writer and yeah. uh, lived in Sag Harbor for years and years and was a really, really dear friend, a Buddhist um, who, who loved Mongolia. And so that was mm. a really fun film to make. And it was a really great project. I'm sure. So how did the tributary fund get started? I mean, was it with- Oh, we just got our two minute break. Can you can you oh. do that in like in a minute? I can. I can go. Okay. Right I know you um, can. I, know you can. <laughs> I really um, became convinced that working with religious leaders, just as you said, was a route to um, bringing broad communities into the conservation um, sort of campaign or this this getting people invested. And so um, the tributary fund, um, our first project was in Mongolia, uh, working with scientists, Buddhist monks, and um, local um, nomadic people. And I'm happy to um, talk about it until we get to the break, but I, I, it was one of the best things I've ever done. Uh, we rebuilt a Buddhist monastery that became the site of conservation dialogue. We worked with Buddhist monks who translated a sutra saying that the death of one time in, which was the fish we were working on, equals the souls of 990 people suffering. So that was way more compelling than us talking about fish populations. So right. um, that, was, that was really neat to be able to go into sacred text and see yes. something that resonated with people. And the Taiman is this, it's six foot, 180 pounds as a giant fish. And when they heard that the death of one of those fish equals the um, souls of 999 people suffering, that they got on board. That made a difference. <laughs> <laughs> well, it really connects us to our reverence for all life. Yeah. And, and that's at the heart of all of this. That is at the heart of, well, in my opinion, it's every problem that we have in humanity, period. Um, number one being our, our climate crisis. But we must take our first commercial break. When we come back with Betsy, we are going to dive into her storytelling and her first book, Oh, where's the name of it? Here it is. Clive, but uh, no, American Zion, Clive Bundy, 
God and Western public lands. When we come back on the edge of every day, stay tuned. Can't wait. <laughs> Are you a business owner? Do you want to be a business owner? Do you work with business owners? Hi, I'm Stephen Fry, your small and medium-sized business or SMB guy. And I'm the host of the new show, Always Friday. While I love to have fun on my show, we take those Friday feelings of freedom and clarity to discuss popular topics on the minds of SMBs today. Please join me and my various special guests on Friday at 11 a.m. on talkradio.nyc. Are you a conscious co-creator? Are you on a quest to raise your vibration and your consciousness? I'm Sam Leibowitz, your conscious consultant. And on my show, The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, we will touch upon all these topics and more. Listen live at our new time on Thursdays at 12 noon Eastern time. That's The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, Thursdays, 12 noon on talkradio.nyc. Are you on edge? Hey, we live in challenging, edgy times, so let's lean in. I'm Sandra Bargeman, the host of The Edge of Every Day, which airs each Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. Tune in live with me and my friends and colleagues as we share stories and perspectives about pushing boundaries and exploring our rough edges. That's The Edge of Every Day on Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC. Uplift, educate, empower. Chipping around, kick my brain to the ground. These are the days it never rains. On the edge of every day, and we are back with Betsy Gaines Quammen. Is it Quammen or Quayman? It's Quammen. I always just okay. say it. it rhymes with ramen. You know, I only heard, I listened to and, and, and heard it pronounced, and all of a sudden, right before the show, I was like, what was it again? <laughs> <laughs> so I, before we dive into storytelling, I do want to make a point that, when, and I'll do this again at the end of the show, but your CV, when you go to Betsy's website, as I suspect you will all want to do ASAP, she click on her CV, the publications, the films that she's done. It's unbelievable. So go run, don't walk, go there. And you can find the link to this uh, Buddha and the big fish. And I'll give that again, and it will be in our show notes. So don't worry, you'll get it. But but I did want to make sure that everyone knows that you can have, because I feel like we rushed that story about the tributary fund, but you can read much more about it and watch that movie. And it's, you know, this is the problem with only one hour with commercial breaks. You just don't have all the time in the world. And how much do you push forward? So enough chit chat. I'm going to push forward onto storytelling and your first book. So you I read, uh, got your BA in writing. So I suspect storytelling and writing was also really kind of your first avenue. As a journalist, you're really connected to storytelling. Did you ever um, perceive that you were gonna write a book? How did, the, how did your, how, what was the spark for American Zion, Clive Bundy, God and Western public lands? Well, it wasn't, it came out of my dissertation and um oh that's right I didn't remember hearing you say no 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 that's okay um you know I'm married to a writer who I I don't even know how many books he's done now he's he wrote for (laughs) National Geographic forever I mean he's really a prolific he's prolific and he's brilliant and so I I didn't exactly aspire to be a writer. Um, Mm -hmm. I I really, my work came out of my activism, but what I found was that in writing the dissertation, 
on and and it's about Mormon settlement in the West and how some of the roots of early Mormon theology uh, have influenced some of the the land use wars and and conflict and and quite honestly I was able to kind of look at a roadmap that takes us to rebellion on public land right to January 6th. So there are influences and I felt really strongly about it. I mean, I, I was seeing these things. I was seeing religious um, facets that that were um, validating acts of violence. And, um, and so when I started the book, I was looking at how conservation was being impacted by rebellion on public lands. And um, I don't know if, if your audience remembers, uh, there were two incidents in particular, there was um, an incident in um, an incident in Nevada, where a ranching family named the Bundys yeah. uh, went off, uh, uh, engaged in a standoff against um, law enforcement, and nobody was killed, but militia from all over the country joined in. The feds turned tail, and it became one of the most galvanizing moments in in um, militia, you know, modern militia history in the United States. The second incident was the takeover of a wildlife refuge in Oregon, where um, armed occupants were there for 41 days. And yeah. this was federal land. This was a wildlife refuge that families go to and bird watch. And they were there for 41 days. They desecrated um, sacred native, uh, or excuse me, um, Northern Paiute land. Um, and uh, one of the militia members was killed. Several were arrested, but they never faced consequences. They were acquitted uh, in um, Oregon and there was a mistrial in Nevada. And so I didn't know that when I embarked on this research to look at um, early Mormon worldview and why there was such a, um, a religious uh, um, foundation to these land use wars that I would be pivoting and not, it's not pivoting, it's integration. We've talked about this. Yes. I would be looking at how conservation um, has become tangled in radicalism and not conservation is, but the, the conservation um, public land protection yes. has now been entangled in radicalism and that this radicalism is now tangling into COVID measures and school board meetings and stop the steal and January 6th. Six. And it's the same people who are, you know, were involved in this, you know, what I thought was a um, outlying, outlier, an outlier right. um, event. But then I visited the family in 2015. 2016 was the Oregon um, takeover. And then from there, this movement has just metastasized. How was it to meet the family? My God. Well, they were very nice to me. Um, they they gave me a signed Book of Mormon. I think there was, because I knew so much about um, the um, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Latter Saints, Saints. Uh, they were interested in mission, you know, doing missionary. Yeah, proselytizing um, to you, sure. And it, and it is really, I do want to do one quick plug because I don't know, have you, have you watched Under the Banner of Heaven, the new Hulu series? No. Oh, it's it's so good, and and it's it is fictionalized, and and um, there are issues that I that I know um, make it a little bit um, upsetting to members of the church. But it, if anybody out there is interested in watching a really uh, it, that will be me series based on some so serious facts, I rest it's, assured. And it's, what, oh, oh, go ahead. No, I, that's all. <laughs> what is their what is their stance on what is their relationship to um, the land, public lands? What what why? Okay, so the Bundy family, like many other Western ranchers, lease public lands. So they lease federal the property that essentially belongs to all Americans. You right. know, we have our national parks and we have our national forests and we have what's called Bureau of Land Management land. Yes. And these are all, this is all land that we can go to anytime we want with our families. You know, for, for 
recreation, for spiritual um, sort of renewal, for, you know, and then of course it's wildlife habitat. So I go back to my Martha the passenger pigeon. The, this land mm -hmm. is really necessary for grizzly bears and wolves and mountain lions. And it's so important. And um, the Bundys were leasing land from the government. Uh, and in 1993, he was, uh, he stopped paying for it. And this was because there was an endangered species that used the land that he, he's in the Mojave Desert. So it's not a great place for uh, cows anyway, cows. but it's a yeah. great place for the desert tortoise. And, um, and this is a, a species that was, that they were seeing numbers plummet. And, and what they did was um, Bruce Babbitt at the time was the Department of Interior for, mm. under Clinton. And he talked to these ranchers who, who were um, leasing public lands. And he said, we will pay you money. We will buy you out so that we can protect this habitat. And it's, and it's really incredible habitat that's not great to ranch. I mean, it's a terrible, it cows <laughs> not a lot there. It's yeah. great for- This is a good orders. deal. Take it. <laughs> So it's kind of like if you had a landlord that was going to be, you know, uh, wanting another tenant, that they would come to you and say, we're going to give you money to move out. I mean, it, it, it's, they were, they were leasing this. They weren't, yeah, they, didn't, they own didn't own it, it at right. all. Yeah. But they, but he refused and he stopped paying um, his bills. And 20 years later, the government finally got around to going and confiscating his cows he let the militia know they all flocked there. There were there were anywhere between 750 and a thousand militia that that came in. Um, and uh, and then I should say there were also like other families, and it wasn't all militia, it wasn't all people with AR 15s, but there they, they were there. there. They were, and um, the government backed down because uh, they didn't want to have bloodshed. They didn't want to see what happened in Waco, which is always something that is talked about at these um, events. And, um, and so when I wrote American Zion, I thought people really need to know about what's happening in the West. And, and I think that people, um, the West is little understood. I mean, I think people think cowboys and they think of the show Yellowstone and they, yes. you know, um, they, they think of- The I, myths I, of machismo and- Yeah. The I'm so independent. Individualism. And, um, and so I wanted people to know that there are things happening out here that are dangerous and are, could- affect the rest of the um, country and did affect the rest of the country. Um, you know, I, I just, the, the networks out here really helped to empower some of what we saw on January 6th. And so, yeah. um, so when I wrote American Zion, I did it as a, you know, sort of act of activism, but I will say I had a great time writing it. And um, as I took a dissertation, which is notoriously dry and, and I, and I think of you saying my CV, my CV is just an academic CV. You're supposed to put on every little thing you've ever done. And it's so boring to read, but well, it's, it's not boring. No, no, <laughs> but, it's, but the book, the dissertation was boring. And then when I wrote the book, I thought, okay, this is a juicy story. I can maybe yeah make it so that people are going to actually want to turn the page and um it's going into its second printing so i guess it worked yay congratulations congratulations i expect a signed copy oh i'll send you one of course oh uh, thank you thank you um okay you know i still want to know what what the religious reason what 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 or excuse for this behavior. Of course, I'm always fascinated by, you know, what, what kind of excuse is gonna be pulled out religiously for this kind of behavior, but we need to go to break. So I will quickly ask you that at the top of our third round, when we come back, we're also gonna talk about courageous conversations, listening, deep listening. Betsy is inspiring in this category. When we come back, on the Edge of Every Day with Betsy Quayman. Ramen. Quaman. Qu I did it again with Betsy Quaman. <laughs> when we come back with Betsy Gaines Quaman. <laughs> I'm Joseph Franklin McElroy, host of the new podcast, Gateway to the Smokies. It airs on talkradio.nyc every Tuesday night from 6 p.m. to 7 
and every episode is dedicated to memorable experiences in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and surrounding areas. This show features experts and locals who expound upon the richness of culture, history, and adventure that awaits you in the Smokies. Tune in every Tuesday from 6 p.m. to 7 on talkradio.nyc. Are you passionate about the conversation around racism? Hi, I'm Reverend Dr. TLC, host of the Dismantle Racism Show, which airs every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern on talkradio.nyc. Join me and my amazing guests as we discuss ways to uncover, dismantle, and eradicate racism. That's Thursdays at 11 o'clock a.m. on talkradio.nyc. Are you a small business trying to navigate the COVID-19 related employment laws? Hello, I'm Eric Sauber, employment law business law attorney and host of the new radio show, Employment Law Today. On my show, we'll have guests to discuss the common employment law challenges business owners are facing during these trying times. Tune in on Tuesday evenings from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern time on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC at www.talkradio.nyc. Now broadcasting 24 hours a day. Chipping around, kick my brain to the ground. These are the days it never rains. On the edge of every day. And we are back with Betsy Gaines Quammen. And we're going to pick it up with uh, that quick question. What is that religious reason that of Mormonism that supports in their mind this behavior? Yeah, that's a good question. And that really is about what um, American Zion is about. It's, it's, uh, it's a m- many, many different aspects. It, mm-hmm. it, number one, when the Mormon people went from Missouri to Illinois to um, the Great Basin, they were doing it because in part, uh, mobs were running them out of a, a place that their wow. prophet had said was their sacred homeland. So when they got to the Great Basin, Utah, Idaho, and um, some of the other places that we see still very strong Mormon um, you know, populations and communities, uh, they brought with them the idea of sacred landscape, which they called Zion. And yeah. Zion was, um, once that got established on top of Southern Paiute homeland, um, in, <laughs> this is again in the way that, that um, it, this has been historically perceived by, um, and, and I should say, this isn't the Mormon church. This, these are ways of viewing things that, that you find in rural Mormon communities. Yeah, so, more extreme conservatism type right, of thing. Yeah. Right. But it's not a basic more, tenant. It's yeah, exactly. And the, and the church has actually condemned the actions of the Bundys. But, um, but uh, you had this idea that Zion sacred homeland was, you know, it was, it was a, um, it was theirs. Uh, it just happens to be also overlaid on public lands. So, right. so that was one thing. They also have a very um, specific religious obligation to the Constitution. So the Bundys would tell you that they understand the Constitution better than you do, and that it's it's incumbent upon them to protect it. So some of their actions go back to that. There's there's prophecy and apocryphal prophecy, and I mean it, it's it's very interesting. It, 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 you know to, oh, yeah. to read about this history. Um, but it but they can justify their actions by prophets, by prophecies, by um, it really is early Mormon theology. At least they feel they can justify it. So mm-hmm. it's, it's I, I, as I said, it was a really fun book to write because there's a lot of these kind of archaic, obscure, you know, I, I mean, and then it, it, this was a time of polygamy. So I also write mm-hmm. extensively about polygamy wow. and um, it, you know, because that's, the other reason that they went to um, the the uh, Great Basin uh, in order to practice polygamy. Polygons, so, yeah. Oh, it's, oh, I can't wait to read it. I cannot well, wait. You'll to be read getting it. a copy. Yes. <laughs> uh, and you'll get a you'll be getting a CD of the Edge of Every Day. Oh, goody! Uh, 
Yay, which you can get on Amazon.com and on CD Baby. <laughs> um, so let's move to, that's a great seg into the storytelling. Uh, my goodness, the conversations you must have had with this family and, and the skills that you have. You know, I, I, I just did a show where I had to talk about uh, building bridges and having courageous conversations and enough time from the Trump trauma has, you know, asked me three years ago, and I would have said, I am not engaging in any courageous conversations. We need to be dealing with the same set of facts, with uh, the same reality. And I've I've come full circle. I've come back to know, um, at knowing full well that now is the time to step in the into the power of courageous conversations. And your work is so, and your next book is employing this so incredibly. So your next book due out in fall 2023, correct? Yes. Um, and it, the title is True West, Sorting Realities on the Far Side of America. I love that. I mean, that's got a lot of levels. It's brilliant. Brilliant. So, so and I love, I heard you say in something that I listened to that your primary source of activism is your courageous conversations. And I love, I love that. And as a white woman. So there's so much to weave into that with the indigenous culture, with people of color, with, with the courage to hop into these conversations across the aisle. So speak to us about your experiences and your stories around that. Well, I thank you for asking that. I have had, again, a really great time writing this book. And I, like you, spent the last several years very angry. And um, I'm realizing we are told about each other through the media we watch or, you know, or, or we read or... Um, we, our social media, uh, the you know the the press, whatever, and so going into little communities and talking to people has been incredibly um, good for me. And and I, because mm -hmm. I I I'm not good being angry. I don't I don't think we can get things. We Nothing can't get gets things no. Done. We have to focus it and transmute it into action. And that's what my chapter in Leslie's book is about. Well, and I can't wait to read that. Um, but one of the things, and, and you asked me about some of the conversations that I've been having, I just gave a talk to a girls program. It's called the Traveling Girls School. And they are the most adorable 16 year old girls that are working, they're taking a class on the West and they're from all over the world. And so I, I, I was talking to them and, and I just said, oh my God, I just thought of this, you know, sort of what I'm doing, um, that relationship building um, is the antithesis of radicalization. Relationship really um, confronts radicalization. And I've been so worried about rural communities being vulnerable to, to these radicalized mm. messages and they are. Yes. And, um, and so I've, I've had unbelievable opportunities to um, talk to people in small towns that do get, I mean, that we are politically very different and, and yet we, I, I mean, I now get texts from people like Betsy, I just saw da 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 and reminded me of you or, you know, I, whatever. I mean, I've now become friends with, with, a, i I mean, almost everybody I interviewed with my book or for my book, and I talked to um, and you know a, a very 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 conservative rancher who said, you know, I've been radicalized, and then he invited me to his ranch, and it turns out he's one of the. I mean, we just adored each other, and he hasn't been radicalized, but but he's vulnerable to that. Yes. Um, I talked to an African American man who's one of two African Americans living in a town, a tiny town of 400 people, who um, said, "I have been welcome in every single family's house. I've been invited to every picnic, um, and uh, and you know, I had a different version of that. I would have thought, oh God, it's so dangerous. And yeah. he's had a wonderful time. I have talked to um, a woman who um, came out of the Mormon church and is now living in a tiny little town. She works for the federal government and really has grown um, sort of protective of her Mormon culture because wealthy, 
recreationalists, you know, hipsters come in and they're really condescending oh, to yeah. um, rural Mormon people. And well, um, period. It's that way here in the Catskills. I watch it all the time. And, and yeah, and I, I have had it's been my liberal friends who have said, oh, why do we even talk to you know, people who are ignorant. And I had another woman who she's a really good friend and I adore, and she's from a tiny little community in New Mexico, but she said, you know, um, she works with human rights and she works with um, fighting white supremacy and that kind of thing. And, and she said, my liberal friends have said, why do you even bother with rural communities? And I'm thinking, because they're the communities that are vulnerable, vulnerable. and they're the communities that are hurting. And um, and so that's been really, I mean, I, you know, I did have this conversation with, with um, the Bundys and I have talked to militia. I'm not trying to change hearts and minds. I mean, I when I hear people who are truly radicalized, I know that I'm not the person who is right. going to be- You are able, not that bridge builder. I, I'm not. And and I have I have real problems. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't want to work with people who are white supremacists. I just, I, 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 I know that they need people. And I, I think that I've heard wonderful stories about white supremacists who've come out of that community and then go and do rehab with that community. And I think that's super cool, but yeah. I, I'm not that person. But what I can do is talk to people, listen to them um, and, uh, and, and relationship build. And, and that's been the exercise of this book is, is building relationships between different constituents and communities and trying to understand where they're coming from. Yeah. Do you feel that as a woman, you're better at that? You know, I guess I, I do have to say I shouldn't say better because I, I mean, like, I don't mean to say men aren't good at that. But I but I feel in this instance, in this way, on this path, maybe it is a it is better. Well, it's it's a really good question. I think that men who come out of a rural culture could do it. I, I think that, you know, if you mm. grew up on a ranch and you talk to other ranchers and they knew your family and, you know, you might have played There's some traditional lines in yeah. the sand that that. Yeah, that you right. you're, you're you play football with their kid or whatever. Right. But if as an as somebody who's not part of a community, I can go into um, these communities because I, I mean, for better or for worse, I'm a woman, I'm white, I'm non-threatening, um, uh, you know, and, and I actually really care. Um, I, I don't have an agenda. So I'm not going in and saying, why would you ever vote that way? I, I, I'm going in and saying, just tell me about what's important. And, and, um, you know, let, let's, let's, I, I mean, I, I'm just there to hear them. And I actually think one of the coolest things, Sandra, is that because of COVID people were so hungry for conversation. Oh yes, absolutely. That, that I was just invited in. I sat and had coffee in people's kitchens. I sat, you know, I, I went in, um, to coffee houses. I, I met one guy who retired from the railroad, you know, at his favorite bar. And it was right <laughs> across the street from the old, um, depot. And, you know, I just, um, I've been on ranches. I've been on farms. I've, I've, um, been on, um, kayaking trips. I've been on hikes. I, you know, I, I'm just here to listen and let's do something cool. And, um, and that's what I've been doing. Well, for the I, last I, and so, and your openness and your effervescence and your zest for this work shines through. And so, you know, that is extraordinary. And I, I, I can really take a great lesson from you. Um, but we have to go to break before we continue. So when we come back, I would like to ask you about, um, the indigenous women that you're encountering in this work. And I would like to get into, uh, and how you see their leadership potentially shifting with all of this work and then get into your leading edge. So when we come back with Betsy Gaines Quammen on the edge of every day, stay tuned, everybody. Hey, everybody, it's Tommy D, the nonprofit sector connector coming at you from my attic. Each week here on talkradio.nyc, I host a program, Philanthropy in Focus. Nonprofits impact us each and every day, and it's my focus to help them amplify their message and tell their story. Listen each week 
at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time until 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on talkradio.nyc. In a post-COVID world, you may have many unanswered questions regarding your health. Are you looking to live a healthier lifestyle? Do you have a desire to learn more about mental health and enhance your quality of life? Or do you just want to participate in self-understanding and awareness? I'm Frank R. Harrison, host of Frank About Health, and each Thursday, I will tackle these questions and work to enlighten you. Tune in every Thursday at 5 p.m. on talkradio.nyc, and I will be Frank About Health to advocate for all of us. Calling all pet lovers. Pet Avengers, assemble! On the Professionals and Animal Lovers show, we believe the bond between animal lovers is incredibly strong. It mirrors that bond between pets and their owners. Through this program, we come together to learn, educate, and advocate. Join us live every Wednesday at 2 p.m. at talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC at www.talkradio.nyc. Now broadcasting 24 hours a day. Chipping around, kick my brain to the ground. These are the days it never rains. But it falls on the, on the edge of every day. And we are back with Betsy Quammen. I Before we dive into the Indigenous and, and women of color um, question, I, I do want to quickly ask you, has there been something in these courageous conversations, in your willingness to open up and to reach out? Are there any techniques or things that you are surprised that you learned in, in this work? Something that you didn't expect that you can share with our listeners as they contemplate how it is they might start to have these difficult and courageous conversations? Yeah, two things come to mind. Um, number one, I had a conversation with a very, very, very conservative guy, um, late 60s, uh, maybe mid 60s. And, um, you know, we, we talked about any number of issues. I, I mean, I actually spent the day with him, you know, riding around in his truck and, um, and he wrote me afterwards and he said, um, if I, if I hadn't been able to meet you, I would have been scared of who you are. Like if, if I hadn't, if I had not had my time with you, I would have been scared of you because of the way liberals are portrayed to, um, conservative people, you know, I, I mean, we're, we're essentially being, um, sketched by Tucker Carlson or Sean Hannity and, um, just hanging out with him. I mean, I, that meant a lot to me that he would be willing to, to say that because he and I have really become friends. The other thing that surprised me is that, um, I, I spent a lot of time with a woman who was an adamant, adamant, adamant anti-vaxxer and, and really influenced by QAnon. And, um, I was far more sympathetic with her, not her ideology, um, but the real um, manipulation that had been done to her through various channels on social media. I, I didn't realize how, you know, I'm talking about rural, vulnerable rural communities, but there are a lot of really vulnerable people yeah. who, who spend hours on the internet and and get just pulled in sucked right in right and and i didn't i mean i had been so angry about that um and in talking to her i just felt sad and and so and she's she's part of a family of uh, this family in very very rural like right up on the um north dakota border that i've been spending a ton of time with and her um conspiracy theories have really interfered with her, her family relationship. So it's, it's been, it's so that, so that those two things. Um, so I, compassion, I, I'm hearing compassion and empathy. Yeah. I mean, you know, hello, compassion yeah. and empathy. And you also said earlier, you know, I'm not going to go down some rabbit hole with some crazy talk. Uh, you know where to draw your line in the, in the sand and where your boundaries are, but your willingness to put that line far out and to fill that space with empathy and compassion is what invites people over the bridge. Yeah. 
Yeah. Amen. Beautiful. So what's, um, as you are working with, uh, are you working, I shouldn't assume you are, are you working with um, indigenous women and women of color in this quest? Oh my gosh. Um, I have had fabulous, fa I, one of my, um, actually a dear friend uh, runs an organization out here and um, I've talked to her and I'm trying to figure out how to fit this in the book because I, I, I'm talking about so many different things, but, but she's an African-American woman who was a, uh, on the police force um, in, oh, uh, oh, oh, where does the name, Palo Alto. And mm. she, she and her husband retired out here and she's doing a, a ton of research on the history of lynchings in the West. And it's very, very, very interesting. Um, she's, yeah, it's, it's really, it's brutal. And so, um, she and I have, have, in, uh, in fact, she called today and I need to call her back. So, um, uh, I also have talked to, I, I cannot tell you, um, the native women that, that I've come across in my work and, um, and some of them are really dear friends. Uh, my friend mm -hmm. Francine is an oral historian. She just got her master's at, um, at Columbia. And she is doing the oral tradition of um, bison and, and looking at bison herds all throughout the West and, and how different tribes uh, encountered bison and how they use bison and what are they doing now? Because right now uh, in Yellowstone, because of the park being uh, a, an arbitrary boundary, you know, bison migrated and they moved throughout right, the right. West and, and mm. they kill bison every year that leave park boundaries because of local ranchers who don't want bison on their property. It's, it's a terrible situation. So she is, is looking at how uh, indigenous groups are, they're actually taking the bison to the tribes and, and they're doing hunts, traditional hunts. And so she's just looking oh, at wow. the role. It's so cool. And oh she's, my God. she's Northern Cheyenne. So she grew up in Montana. Um, and then my friend, Jill Mamaday, uh, who I got to interview, she's really great. And I, I say, everybody's my friend. I, I met her, uh, we were on a board together and I've met her a good and, thing. and she, I adore her. Uh, and she did a film with her father in Scotland. Oh. Yeah. Who's just an incredible writer, beautiful, just came out with a book called the earth keeper, which I recommend yes. to everybody. I, I just bought it. I oh, literally just bought it. It, his daughter is so cool and the work she's doing in terms of um, looking at what how storytelling is so important in the way Indeed. of viewing landscape and how land and, and she's a perfect person in terms of thinking about interconnectedness because there's no difference between land and prayer and story and people and, and wildlife spirit and, and, and it's just ex the interconnectedness of life. And she, I just had, I had such a great time with her. Um, it was right before her daughter was getting married and we had breakfast together in Santa Fe and um, just, mm. I, I adored her. And then um, I was able, who else have, oh, my friend Tammy, who's the tribal chair of the Indian band of the Southern Paiute. She is the tribal chair. She's in her thirties. She's such a badass. She wants to write uh, a, a history of the um, Indian Peaks band of the Southern Paiute because they got down to so few members. I mean, like maybe a hundred members, they had their land taken away from them. The government had them sign their land away and some of them weren't able to write. They were writing X's on these legally binding. I mean, it's just incredible and heart-wrenching the story of um, indigenous people in the West and how they were, I mean, it's, it's, excruciating. Um, and so I have been able to, I mean, uh, you know, Francine lives here in town where we serve on the wild earth guardians board together. And she's, I just, she's so great and doing this amazing, by amazing bison work. Tammy, uh, I interviewed, uh, for American Zion mm. and, um, Jill, I interviewed for, uh, true West. So, um, yeah. And then, oh gosh, and one other person who everybody needs to know about is a woman named C. Marie Furman, who I'm trying to get now on the Wild Earth Guardians Board, which is a great organization looking at <laughs> protecting Western landscape, because at the end of the day, 
that's my greatest passion. Um, but she's this exquisite poet and writer. And, um, and I've become friends with her during pandemic and we've just written to each other. And now we'll, we'll, you know, do a direct message. And both of us are every time I hear from you, my heart <laughs> just get, like explodes. I mean, we just, we, and I was able to meet her after having this relationship just on virtually or online and i finally met her and we were both like oh my yes. god you're the best human rejoicing and just, it was and she's incredible she is such an exquisite writer and poet mm. and um and she's in idaho so um anyway mm. yes i have been very lucky in meeting unbelievably cool indigenous women and well and it's all your story and you're all you know you're all working and uplifting each other and that's you know in, in this this part of the country that desperately needs you as they as they all parts of our country need the women to uplift and bring us to new conversations and new understandings as we know well where people can find you betsy gains Mm -hmm. Are there any other, and the, the name, your first, uh, your book, can they find that on your website or is there another oh, place? You can order it anywhere. Go okay. to your local bookstore, go online. It's right. widely available. Ask your local bookstore first. Ask That's your my local. favorite. Yes. yes. Um, and if you must get it on Amazon, go for it. But um, they've got it. Yes. <laughs> excellent. <laughs> Um, and be on the lookout for the next book coming out in the fall of 2023. And are there any other resources that you can share with our um, listeners? Um, you mentioned the wildlife that, that you're on the board. Is that that's also on your website? Any other resources that people can go to 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 find more, find out more about your work and what's happening in that part of the world? And courageous conversations. Oh gosh, I mean, I you know, I, I mean, I bet you and I could give a million yeah, ideas I'm, for that. I, righteous I, I, mind comes. Righteous mind, yes. Oh Jonathan. yeah, oh that's yes, I love that book, and that's really really um, helped me frame some of my conversations. Jonathan Haid, I I love that book, The Earth Keeper, um, which we talked about, which is just an excellent book. Um, and, uh, and there are also, um, mountain journal, which uh, if people are interested in the West mountain journal, which is an online, um, publication is really, really good. Oh. High country news is, you know, really talks about Western issues. Oh, and I would say Leah Soltiel, uh, did a fabulous podcast called Bundyville about the Bundys, which was really fun. Um, and she's brilliant. And so I, you know, the, yeah, I, I could go on and on and on and on. Excellent. That's perfect. That's a <laughs> glorious start for our listeners and for me as well. And I can't thank you enough oh. for coming on the edge of every day. It has been a joy and a delight as I knew it would be to spend Sandra, this hour with you. Thank you for having me. This is so much fun. I, I can't wait to have this be continued. I I'm, I'm ready to talk to you again tomorrow. Excellent. I would love to book you. <laughs> Let's do it. And to our listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. Until the next time we speak, remember, you are always at the edge of the miraculous. Take good care. This is our last dance. This is our last dance. This is our search under pressure. Under pressure, under pressure.